Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. We appreciate you making your way down to the Arts District to this program tonight. I'll try to catch my breath, it's running. Tonight, we're having an exhibition talk for Lighting Up Las Vegas, Yesco Marks a Glittering Century, yay! <laughs> My name is Bobby Ann Howell. I'm the program manager here at the Nevada Humanities Program Gallery in Las Vegas. And on behalf of us, we like to, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I welcome you to our discussion. If you don't know who we are, Nevada Humanities is your Nevada arm of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we work to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying their stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. So our program tonight uh, will be recorded and will be posted with the exhibition on our website at nevadahumanities.org. The Nevada Humanities Exhibition Series is a bi-monthly series and it showcases the work of Nevada artists, writers, photographers, journalists, and other creative thinkers and organizations that explore and articulate the sense of place here in the Silver State. And I think you'll discover a lot about that tonight. Um, it engages people in a dialogue about all aspects of the Nevada experience, and we're thankful for the support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we hope that all that continues also with the National Endowment for the Arts and the State of Nevada, which helps fund our programming. Um, tonight, this event is hosted here in Las Vegas, so we want to acknowledge the place that we gather is the traditional land of the Southern Paiutes, who are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land and who have lived here along the Colorado River for over a thousand years, extending north and west into areas today known as Southern Nevada, Utah, and California. Um, our program gallery is located in the Arts District at 1017 South First Street, number 190 in Art Square in the heart of the Las Vegas Arts District. Since 2013, We've been coming together to share exhibitions and we've set aside this time tonight to meet with the presenters to listen and discuss their ideas. We appreciate your willingness and their willingness to meet with us and share with us tonight. This exhibit is also online and if you want to find out more, you can visit us at nevadahumanities.org. Tonight, we have a special guest um, this evening, Congressman Susie Lee, who is currently working in Washington, D.C., has sent a representative from her office. Please welcome Christy Watson. So as you might know, Congress is hopefully voting tonight to uh, pass fiscal year 22, which we are in, <laughs> um, out of the House, and so that will include uh, funding for National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as National Endowment for the Arts, as well as aid to Ukraine. So it's an important vote that she's taking, that's why she can't be here, but um, it's my pleasure, and I, Jeff, if, if you'll accept this, oh, I got, I'll attach it better in just a moment. Um, but this is a Congressional Certificate of Special Recognition presented to Yesco, Young Electric Sign Company, in recognition of over 100 years of shaping and contributing to the glittering culture of Las Vegas. Congratulations, Yesco. Very important and integral um, business in our community. Thank you, Congressman Lee. We really appreciate that recognition. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome a very distinguished panel. Kelly Lux is an exhibition curator, and she's the archivist for the Las Vegas News Bureau. She'll be moderating tonight's discussion, and she's going to introduce the panel and take it from here. Kelly, thank you. Thank you, Bobby Ann. We'd really like to first off by start, start by thanking you and the Nevada Humanities for hosting the exhibit and for supporting the humanities here in Las Vegas. <laughs> Welcome, audience. Thank you all for being here and celebrating Yesco's history with us. Facebook Live, thank you for everybody that's joining in with us there as well. So we're going to start off. I'm going to introduce everybody. This is Jeff Young, the senior vice president of Yesco. 
Emily Felmer, the collections manager at the Neon Museum. And as Bobby Ann said, I am Kelly Lux, the archivist with the LVCVA, Las Vegas News Bureau. We're gonna start with a brief on the exhibit, and then each of us is gonna talk about our respective institutions, and then we're gonna go into the panel questions. And before we're done, we will open it up to any questions that you and the audience may have as well. So, Las Vegas and Neon are synonymous with each other. When you think of Las Vegas, you think of its dazzling skyline and brilliant lights. Young Electric Sign Company, Yesco, has played a significant role in creating Las Vegas's shining reputation. The company has created many signs that have defined the look and feel of Las Vegas, from the early use of neon on Fremont Street in the 1930s, to the strip spectaculars of the 1950s and 60s, to the cutting edge technologies of today. Yesco has helped mold the image of Las Vegas. Its iconic signs have come to be recognized as works of art and their significance transcends their function as mere advertisements. In celebration of Yesco's 100th anniversary in 2020, this joint exhibi exhibition by the LVCVA's Las Vegas News Bureau and the Neon Museum examines the history and impact of Yesco in Las Vegas. The exhibit follows the intertwined stories of the company, the city, the technology, and the men and women who made it all possible. While the display was slated to open in 2020 to mark Yesco's centennial, it was delayed due to the COVID pandemic, but we are now thrilled to bring this exhibit to the public in 2022 for the 102nd anniversary of Yesco. So as I said, I'm with the Las Vegas News Bureau, which is a part of the LVCVA, or Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. The News Bureau started in 1947 as part of the Chamber of Commerce. And it was back when the casino owners all sat on the chamber and it was post-World War II and they realized they needed to market the destination and bring more people in. So they created the Las Vegas News Bureau. It was a group of photojournalists whose primary goal was to market the destination, take photographs, send it out on the wire and get Las Vegas published at a global area. And it, there, we have over 7 million photographs, 11,000 moving images, and over 1,400 linear feet of manuscripts and artifacts. It is a massive collection. It is the most comprehensive post-World War II collection of Las Vegas in the world. The photographer's whole goal was to market the destination. So they took photos of everything you can imagine, local events, the strip, the skylines, Fremont Street, the celebrities on stage, off stage, backstage. We have photos of Elvis Presley, the Rat Pack, Mother Teresa in Las Vegas, which is one of my favorites. It is an exciting collection. In 1992, the collection moved over to the LVCVA to help promote with their marketing efforts, and it's been with them for nearly 30 years now. This May, 2022, we are celebrating our 75th anniversary, so I'm very excited about that. But the collection is an amazing collection that documents the history of Las Vegas, primarily the marketing efforts of the town. Um, Emily, would you like to talk about the Neon Museum? Yes, the Neon Museum was founded in 1996 to help um, preserve, exhibit, and teach the public about iconic Las Vegas signs. We mainly focus with neon signs, but we also collect a wide variety of other materials, including historic photographs, as well as um, sculptural signs, which may not even have neon. But the um, Allied Arts Council of Southern Nevada really did help promote the Neon Museum and um, its founding. So also thanks to Yesco, um, with collecting all of your signs over the years, you were able to help um, deposit quite a few of the signs we have in our museum today. Jeff, would you like to talk about the origins of Yesco? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. This is a real pleasure for us. Uh, my brother Mike is here, so shout out to shout out to Mike. Hey. It's good to have you here. So our uh, our company was founded. My grandfather, bless his heart, he uh, he immigrated to the U.S. from England as a teenager. His dad, there was a lot of immigration in the 1920s. And in, 19, in 1910, 
Um, I was off a 10 years, sorry about that. In 1910, the family boarded the SS Dominion and came to the US. They, they ended up in Utah, of all places. He had worked the coal mines and ended up with a railroad job. And so my grandfather, only 15 years old in 1910, he loved to draw, he loved hand lettering. He, he got a loan from his dad for $300 and began this company. And word has it, this is legend, that his mother told his father, don't loan him the money, he'll never pay you back. <laughs> <laughs> so he started this company and it, he was hand lettering. He was doing show cards, uh, he was doing coffin plates, and, but he was a dynamic, hardworking man, and uh, we owe a lot to Tom, Tom Young Sr. for everything he did. He got a license for Neon in 1927, and uh, he was traveling through Nevada to see his brother in L.A. Uh, his father was, um, was transferred to the Roundhouse in Sparks, Nevada, so he was traveling in northern Nevada, and he was just going everywhere, selling signs to whomever would buy them. He was a gifted designer. And if it weren't for him and his vision of what these signs were to look like, you know, we would not be standing here today without his hard work and ingenuity. Uh, today, we're, uh, we have a corporate uh, population of about 900 employees. We have a franchise network in the eastern part of the U.S. and Canada. So our total, our total YESCO employee base is about 1,700 people. We have 110 uh, locations. The, most, the largest of those locations is right here on Cameron Street. And we are so grateful to be part of this community. We're so grateful to be part of this wonderful economy. And who can't just get the heartbeat just going? You know, when you think about neon and the bright lights and to be part of that and part of building that, <clears throat> there is a greater honor that, that we would have as a family, as an organization. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you. First question goes to Emily. Why did the LVCBA Las Vegas News Bureau and the Neon Museum partner together for this exhibit? Well, the Neon Museum collection is compiled of many YESCO signs. So to help celebrate their anniversary, we partnered together. Since you guys have all the photos, we have all the signs. It worked out perfectly. <laughs> yes, as well as um, your institution is one of the largest repositories of iconic historic Las Vegas images. We wanted to help be able to really extract some of those images out to help tell your family's story and how our landscape has changed so much over the decades. That's part of the reason why we divided the exhibit into the decades as well. And we have partnered together in the past. We've done exhibits with the Nevada Humanities called Then and Neon, where we had photographs of the signs as they originally stood and then photographs of the signs in the neon boneyard. So we have a great working history together. Jeff, Emily, can you talk about the early relationship of the Neon Museum and YESCO? Yes. You want to start? Sure, okay. yes. <laughs> so um, YESCO, um, in the past, they would lease out their signs to properties. When they would get the signs back, they, you had a boneyard here in Las Vegas. They, which, they call it hoarding <laughs> these days. <laughs> when you just keep it and never throw it away. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Sorry. It's your time. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, which, so yeah, you have many of your signs in your boneyard. Um, it's very interesting over the years, sometimes they would use portions of the signs either to recreate different signs or even use transformers from an older piece to use into something new. So with the bones of the signs in the boneyard, um, in the early 2000s, YESCO um, wanted to move in a different direction in that location where they held the boneyard. So to help partner with us. You um, helped grant us about one third of the signs we have on display today were YESCO signs, um, including some of our trademark ones like the La Concha Motel sign, the Ugly Duckling um, used car sale lot sign, as well as um, many signs from Binion's as well as many other historic properties here in town. So thank you. Yes, on, on our end of things, so the sign would come down uh, and we didn't save every one of them. Right, but we saved a lot of them. And so we started getting odd requests from people saying, hey, do you mind if we come by and take a picture? And uh, do, do you mind if we do a photo shoot, a fashion photo shoot? And uh, do you mind if we film a movie using this part? And we'd loan them out and they'd to take them away and bring them back. And so we we're in this really weird, we're manufacturers, but we're in this really weird situation where people want to come back and like, well, who do we have in our staff to watch to make sure that you know, nothing gets damaged, nothing's stolen. So we're not really curators, we're not museum operators. And what came to be in the early 90s was a need to expand our operation. We had to build a building. 
and that building was, uh, was constructed in the mid-90s. And as that came together, we, um, we had nowhere to put the signs. We didn't know what to do. And if it weren't for the Arts Council and weren't for the city of, of Las Vegas, uh, there's a good chance that all those signs would have just been thrown away. And we think now and shudder to imagine that happening. You know, all we can think about is the signs at times gone by that we wish we had a piece of that we don't. And so uh, we're very, very grateful for, for those individuals who stepped forward at that magic moment uh, to make the, you know, get the museum and make it happen. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a wonderful thing to behold. It really is a wonderful place on the planet, for sure. And even the curation of the boneyard was partly designed by your boneyard as well to kind of help capture what it would have looked like, you know, in the back lot of Yesco. So it was a great help, uh, inspiration for us. <laughs> Excellent. So the next question is for myself. It is, <laughs> why did we choose these photos? So as I said, my collection has 7 million images, which is just amazing. 95% of the exhibit is photographs from my collection. The other 5% are photographs that we did a lot of the research at UNLV's special collections and archives. So about 5% of the photos are from that collection. And when you go visit the exhibit after the talk, you will see those credited in the photo caption. But when we were looking at the exhibit and doing the research, myself and the staff from the Neon Museum, we decided which signs, we wanted to break it up by the decades because there are so many significant signs from Yesco that added to the skyline, that added to the history of Las Vegas. So we tried to break it up by the decades and choose some of the best signs from each decade. Everything from the beginning with the Boulder Club on Fremont Street, highlighting the stardust, the horseshoe, going into more modern times and looking at the Rio signs, the wind, Caesar's Palace, Aria. So we tried to look at photographs from that whole timeline. And we chose the important signs while we were doing the research and the signs that spoke to us. And then with this collection my size, it's really easy to go back in and find some amazing photographs. It's actually almost hard to narrow down which photographs to use because there are so many. So it just, it fit together really nicely. Yesco has a rich and live history here in Las Vegas and we have the photographs to represent it. Question, Jeff, can you talk about how the technology of signs has changed in the last 100 years? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Big question. Let's see, 100 years ago, no computers I, yeah, for a start, right? So yeah, the, at the turn of the century, um, you know, 1879 was the light bulb, commercial light bulb, right? So before then, signs were illuminated with gas lamps, and we still have a few of these cabinets. I mean, the signs are functionally plumbed with gas. They're lit, and you have flicker. Well, they, they were glass. The, the stuff that was translucent was glass, and so we, we, you know, we had this era where we were lighting signs with, with gas lamps, which is phenomenal. So the light bulb, you can't understate the light bulb. I mean, it's really changed our lives. And that story of the light bulb, if you've seen the movie, uh, you know, that show about Edison and Tesla, um, and all that that came together, it's a remarkable story that we could, we could spend hours talking about just that. But the light bulb and the eventual uh, development of tungsten as a filament um, in the early 1900s, is, it was a really, really big deal. And of course, it's a, this, of course we're going to talk about neon. Uh, it was a Frenchman, Georges Claude, who found a way to purify the neon element, which is in our atmosphere, he was able to industrialize the purification of glass and, and specialize in the electrodes that makes, makes it light up. And so his patent was filed in the early 1900s. Paris, 1912, uh, the, uh, we got our license in 27. Uh, the first neon in Las Vegas went up on the Overton, uh, the Overton Hotel, right on the corner where Circa is today, right there on the corner. They were 10 inches tall, it said hotel. <laughs> and uh, brace yourselves, we didn't build it. <laughs> it wasn't our sign. That was in 1928. The Review Journal did an article, a short little blurb about my grandfather who showed up in 1932. So we all think he was here before then, doing this and that, but uh, the first formal uh, notation we have of him being here is he had a temporary office in the Apache Motel, and after that the signs just came one after the other after the other, after the other. So that development of neon, to be able to take 
like glass and bend it in any shape in, in, in many different colors was something that just, we're still enamored with it. And we have people call us all the time. Can we see your neon shop? Tell us more about it. Um, we just have a constant inf inflow of people who just would love, just want to just feel it and experience the neon technology. Uh, welding, pop rivets, uh, sheet plastic, translucent vinyls, you know, all these things that have kind of come along, uh, along the way have made a, a big, a big difference. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't not talk about computerization, but the one, uh, and, and computer operated, uh, computer uh, automated design and manufacturing which certainly has taken over. Uh, but you, the, the little point in history I want to emphasize today is an obscure scientist named uh, Koji, um, Shu, Shu, excuse me, Shuji Nakamura is his name, and he worked for Nietzsche. And uh, he invented the blue LED. The red LED had been invented in 1964 uh, by GE. Uh, they, they discovered it, so to speak. And Shuji was someone who had never really had any discovery at all in his career. And the development of the blue LED earned him the Millennial Technology Award, um, 1996, 2006. And then he won a Nobel Prize in 14. So the wording, if you want to look that up and read the wording of those awards, it just gives you goosebumps. Because I, I think that our children and grandchildren will be talking about Shuji like we talk about Thomas Edison for revolutionizing our experience on the planet, the kind of statements made. So when the blue LEDs came out, then we have an opportunity to make full color because we had red, we get green and blue, and then you can do the full big, big screens. And so all that wonderful technology came because of this obscure scientist, and we can't minimize uh, what impact he's had on lighting and illumination. And uh, you know, in the, in the old, in, back in the day when we put up our first color unit, color electronic unit in front of Caesar's Palace, and it was, the power bill was, it was, <laughs> it, you know, you shudder, right? These are, these are like 30 watt bulbs, and it, it burning hot, 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 colored lamps, and this thing was just churning through power. I'm sure the dam was just creaking with the <laughs> consumption of it all. And uh, now we can put up these displays that are just absolutely massive, uh, really for, for the fraction of the electricity. And they're very, very efficient and bringing color and life to Las Vegas. So yeah, so we are, we are in a different world today than we were. And I, I, I called my father, second, I'm third generation, I called my father just a couple of hours ago. And uh, you know, I was asking him a few questions and, and, uh, and the one question was like, you know, what, 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 would your, what would your dad think, you know, our founder? And he says, I think he'd like the Harmon Wall. He really would like the Harmon Wall. And I think he'd really, really love that wind sign. <laughs> so somewhere we, we think that uh, Tom Sr. is looking down and uh, seeing what's happened in Las Vegas. And he's, he's gratified with the creativity. He's gratified with the light and excitement that, that signs create. So yeah, there's been a lot of changes in 100 years. That's for sure. Don't sit down yet. I have a surprise okay. bonus question. A bonus you. question. OK. Yeah, surprise bonus question. Bonus. Which sign, which modern sign, was the most difficult to construct. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it has to be, the, you know, speaking of wind, uh, it has to be the wind, and let me tell you why. So you just drive past it, you don't think anything about it, but um, if you notice, there's that large, we call it the eraser, but there's this large piece in the middle that has a signature on it that moves up and down the sign. Well, you know, you think, oh, it's, it's moving up and down. The sign is actually shaped like it's shaped like a triangle. It's actually three-sided. It only looks two-sided from the street. Um, that eraser weighs 65,000 pounds. And it has three contact points. It's an elevator system. But as you know, the, the mechanical elevator system is coordinated with the electronic programming behind it. And it'll, it'll, it can move as fast as 10 feet a second. So to move 65,000 pounds upwards of 10 feet a second. The, the problem you'd have at height, because it's a 130 foot sign, 30 foot base and 100 feet this way and 50 feet this way, is we had to, we had to have a tolerance of quarter inch at 130 feet. So, you know, we're not building rockets, we're not building space shuttles, right? I mean, aerospace is very tight tolerances, but in our industry, we just don't have tolerances like that at all. And to be able to hit that and for the sign to be working functionally flawlessly, for 16, 17 years now, even with the renovation, 
uh, is a great, wonderful thing. There is, in fact, the weak point there is in a high wind situation. It puts pressure on the, the wheels that run on the tracks inside. And so we have a wind vane on top, and when it does get windy, the system shuts down automatically to protect it from damaging itself. So from a technological perspective, if you just take the circuit boards and the LEDs and all the electronics and all that wiring and the giant 36-foot deep, 8-foot augered holes, and there's three of them, you take all the engineering aside, that thing has worked great for all these years. And we're, as we get these things done, we think, I oh, hope it works. <laughs> in, a, in that case, it has. So we're very happy. Emily, how has the changing technology of, or wait, how has the changing technology affected the way you preserve and restore the signs? Yes, so it adds some complication at moments, um, especially with how wide a variety of materials that make up these signs, like we have fiberglass, um, there are CCFL light bulbs, which aren't even made anymore, and um, yeah, sheet metal to acrylic, so each material needs a different way to help best preserve it and then also that goes to restoring signs where um, some of the materials are not available anymore as well as even just with neon colors at one point there were over 300 colors you could make but now that's um, gone higher and lower over time just because of materials not being available even um, like lead based um, glass for the tubes sometimes that's hard to come by as well as lead-based paints in some signs um, if they're pre-1970s. So each piece has a very different way that needs to best be preserved or restored. Excellent. Emily, what is your favorite Yesco sign? Oh, here we go. Yes. Here we go. Oh, hold on. We're listening. Okay. okay. I'm going to have to break it down. So, um, yeah, there's so many. Um, mainly all the 1950s and 60s design signs. There was just such great powerhouse teams of designers at that time. But I really do enjoy Kermit Wayne design signs. So like the 1958 Stardust facade, as well as the 1961 Golden Nugget um, decorated shed look. Um, those are beautiful. But also the mint has to be <laughs> up on that list as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I would say um, one of the favorite Yesco signs in the museum's collection is um, the Silver Slipper. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I love, there's a photo of when it was um, being transported of some Yesco workers in front of it with the truck. It um, shows such a great scale of how large these signs really are. Even just walking through the boneyard, you don't imagine how big some of them are since you usually see them from your car while walking down the street. So it's amazing being so up close and personal with these works of art and history. Jeff, it's your turn for this question, but trifold. <laughs> what is your grandfather's, your father's, and your favorite signs? Oh, okay, okay. So for my grandfather, let's all join hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't have the benefit of Tom Sr. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I, I called my dad because I wanted to kind of pick his brain to find out, you know, what his dad had thought. And one thing that my grandfather, he was enamored with the, the building of the Boulder Dam. And uh, years and years later, my father remembers very distinctly because he was just a young boy when the dam was completed in 36. Um, he kept pictures of the dam under the glass on his desk for decades. So when he comes to work every day, he's got pictures of the dam. And of course, it's the electricity, right? It's like, oh, think of all that electricity we can use to build bright and shiny signs. And if you look at the Boulder Club, on the bullnose, and I, th I think my grandfather, I'm gonna have to say it's gotta be the Boulder Club because for us, that really started the golden age of neon in 45. It had a, there was another sign in front of Boulder Club from years before, and it was fine, it was a beautiful sign, but this new Boulder Club was one that, that would just really took, took uh, Fremont Street by storm. And he had gone into his motel room and put butcher paper on the wall uh, overnight and rendered that sign in colored pencil took the butcher paper down, rolled it up, took it next, you know, down the street and said, what do you think? And he says, yes, yes, <laughs> let's build it. And so uh, on the bullnose of that sign, he had seen this technology in LA and it included two cylinders that used a lamp creating convection heat and the cylinders would rotate in opposite direction and with the perforations with the light, it would create what looked to be a scintillation and it, it looked as if the water was flowing. And so when you look at the still shots, you know, we don't really, we don't have, you know, video shots of the bullnose, the front of, the very front of that sign. But for my grandfather to go all the way to L.A. and get this technology installed in the bullnose of that sign, given the love he had for the, 
for the dam. I think that has to be has to be it. My father, it's the mint. Thanks for mentioning the mint. He loves the mint. He had taken a, a camera and filmed its construction, design, and installation. And I think one of the reasons why that's, that's buried so deep in my father's heart is because he spent so much time watching it and caring for it. And it's like this principle of, you know, you love who you care for. You love what you put your heart and soul into. Well, my dad put the heart, his heart and soul into that sign. And he, he mentioned to me just hours ago, those sticks of glass were 18 feet long. And they were a challenge. I mean, you know, I mean it's a, that's a two-person thing to get an 18-foot stick of glass installed on, on the front. And then he, as I've talked to him about the mint in the past, we're all just, this is one of those signs we don't have any of it left. It's one of those where like, oh, why didn't somebody <laughs> save that? And then, and then for me, it has to be the guitar, the hard rock guitar. And I, I don't have to go on, you're all nodding your head. You're going, oh, yeah, the guitar. But I talked to Warwick Stone that night, and I had not met him until that evening in March of 2016. And uh, he told me the story himself how he came to Vegas with great idea to put up the first guitar of all guitars. He had been putting Cadillacs in the front of, of uh, Hard Rock. He was their memorabilia guy. He was buying all that memorabilia. And he brought this guitar to us, one of the first he'd ever bought, this Les Paul guitar, and said, Yesco, can you, I have 70, he doubled his, he doubled his, uh, his budget. I've got $70,000. He'd been spending 30 on the Cadillac. I've got $70,000. Let's put up this guitar. So our proposal came back <clears throat> at... Um, 280, 280,000, <laughs> and he's like, wow, what, so uh, we lease signs, so what happens, we, we basically built the guitar for him with our money, and then we charged him monthly payments, which just worked great for us, because it includes maintenance, and, and then we are then the owners of the guitar, so one of the reasons why the guitar is alive today is because my grandfather had the, the foresight to know that customers wanted to lease signs rather than buy them. Because we're not really sure if Hard Rock really wanted that sign in the museum and to pay for the renovation and all that. And so it, it represents so much in craftsmanship, in history, and for it to be there, the first of all the worldwide guitars. And I sat there next to Warwick. In fact, I met, met you that night, Erica, there, that same thing. I sat, I sat there beneath that sign and I said, okay, now we're talking. This thing is gonna be here forever. Oh, and there's a light bulb out right here, right? <laughs> so, you know, we love to take care of signs. So it's, it's hard rock for me. Those are all great options. And just a note on those, they are all in the exhibit. Photographs of each of those signs are in the exhibit. The Boulder Club, including a really great shot of the bullnose, is when you first walk in. We have photographs of the mint, also a rare color photo of the mint in the exhibit and the black and white. And then we also have the guitar sign. So the next question again is for me. It's what is my favorite photo in the exhibit? I'm a photo archivist, I can't answer this with one. There has to be a few. So one of my favorite photos is, I think it's in the 1970s panel. There is a photo of Don English, which was a news bureau photographer, in a Yesco boom truck. And I like this because it shows the partnership between the news bureau and Yesco and everybody's goal to market the destination. It was really a town effort. And Don English, who is a renowned photographer, you guys probably recognize his work. Has anybody ever seen the Miss Atomic Bomb? That was one of Don English's ideas. The floating craps table at the Sands, Don English and Al Freeman came up with that and worked on that photograph. Well, Don English is in the boom truck and he's taking photographs, aerial perspective, of the Stardust camper land. And so that photo for me just speaks a lot to the history of how everybody worked together to market the destination, of the relationships with Yesco and the News Bureau, and just how exciting the destination was. And then it's also great if you like photography, because you can see the Hasselblad around Don English's neck, and he has, a, he has a couple other cameras with him hanging around. So it's just a really great photograph. And then I have to go with one of the iconic photos. And I, I, I honestly don't know how I'm gonna answer this. You've got the iconic photo of Fremont Street with the golden nugget, but then there's this great photo of the horseshoe. And while I was doing the research, I found out the horseshoe has 36,000 feet of neon tubing. I think that has to be my favorite because of that fun fact alone. It's just so amazing. And we have the photographs up during the day 
and at night. And we tried to pair those together when we could so you could just see how impressive and massive they were during the day, but then how they looked when you lit them up at night. So I've got to go with Don English in the boom truck, and the winner's going to go to the horseshoe. <laughs> that was a really, really hard call for me. So next up, Jeff, there's a lot of multi-generational employees in your company, such as Eric Elizondo. Can you talk about the importance of having multi-generational employees and how that has affected your company? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, the reference to Eric, when we talk about Neon and people call us, we, we take him back to Eric because he's, he's blowing glass. He's been blowing glass his whole career. And his father was also in the industry and spent his lifetime blowing glass. So we have two generations of glass blowers. So when you talk to him, you get a real sense for what real sign making is. And it makes our spreadsheets look really, really boring, you know, <laughs> at the office. So we do a lot of things besides glass. Um, in addition, let me mention in 1929, a young man walked in off the street and approached my grandfather and said, I like a job. And he said, I'm not hiring. And this gentleman's name was Ben Jones. And Ben Jones says, well, I'm, I'm actually pretty good. And he says, I'm not hiring. And Ben Jones says, no, I'm actually pretty good. And he says, well, show me. And he handed him a show card and a paintbrush. And he says, draw me a letter S, which is hard, a freehand S. And my grandfather was impressed. And he hired Ben Jones. And all the, pretty much every sign you see on the display in there were, were engineered by Ben, who never took a single engineering class, which is, you know, you think about that. We have his books. He studied hard, and he was a gifted artist and a gifted architect, and then drew all the mechanical drawings. Uh, Ben's son worked for us his whole career in operations, and his son, the grandson of Ben Jones that walked in the door in 1929, is our head engineer and has written the sign engineering book that's sold by our industry, the you know, engineering signs in our industry. So you know, we, you know, we, we feel like we're great benefactors by people who have come to us and have recommended their children to, to work there. And there, I think it said, and I've heard my brother Mike say this, there's no greater honor for us to have someone recommend a family member to come to work for us. We did a, a quick, in the last five years, all the hiring we've done, uh, between Indeed, we all know Indeed, <laughs> and friends and family, um, between those three, 60% of our employees, if you take Indeed out of the picture, 60% of our, our employees come from someone they know. And so, and those tend to stay longer than those we hire from Indeed because there's a, there's a deeper, rich history there. So I think part of it is the same reason you're sitting here tonight and we're talking about signs. It just kind of gets into you, you know, and you, you, when you build them, you have such pride and when you see them, you think about them, you go, I want to build the next one. And regardless of what your, your role in the company, whether you're designing, whether you're building, whether you're collecting, you know, whatever you're accounting, whatever you're doing, you feel, you feel a real kinship and a connection with, with science. And I think that's the reason why people come to our industry and our company, and they just never want to leave. And uh, so we're benefactors of, of a lot of very wonderful people. Before you sit down, oh, yes. the next question is also for you. Can you okay. tell us about the night watch at Yeska? Okay, so night watch. So um, I think I think I, we're probably talking about what we call night patrol. Yes. So maybe if you've got some not heads nodding, we're lucky because our our products are out visible. <laughs> so we uh, we in terms of sign repair, we'll repair anything. You know, it's like we're not just you know we're not just repairing. It's any old light bulb, any neon, any fluorescent light at all. So yeah, we have crews that go out at night uh, religiously, and we pr we we have signs under contract. We're obligated to see them. We have signs that are not under contract. We'd love to fix them, and so we send out our patrol. And we have a beautiful software application. It geolocates and records and queues up to our database. And so our team the next morning after our after our patrol around town knows exactly what needs to happen in every single spot, and then we can get, get it moving. We're doing patrol across the whole, across pretty much all North America. You know, we have literally hundreds of patrollers that are out looking at signs. So, you know, in our industry, there's a lot of people that build signs, and we're not the only company that maintains them, but we tend to feel like it's, it's a, a much higher priority for us to take care, to be the caretakers. And amongst those is the Welcome to Las Vegas sign, which we own and we lease to the county. So that's our sign. It's on the historic register, okay, for historic places. I drove past today, and, and you know, there's a lineup of people. And those light bulbs, you know, we just, you know, we, we take, when they burn out, we replace them. And we're watching that sign all the time because it needs to be lit up for millions and millions of visitors that, that come by. 
uh, come through this community. So anyway, that's our that's my short answer. Okay. Emily and Jeff, can you tell us about the move in the restoration of the hard rock guitar? Oh, that's, yes. that's a good one. So it's an 82 foot guitar. It took a lot to get it down into seven pieces, as well as to electrify our site for it to be illuminated at nighttime. We even had to build a large trench into the ground to get all this electricity to it. And it was you know, um, brought to Yesco for the restoration. Um, even the ruby glass on it specifically um, was shipped across seas because it's such a specific color and it's a very beautiful color as well. <laughs> Did you want to add in? Oh yeah, so, um, <laughs> and again, I, I, I'm, you're gonna see some hesitation because I don't want to, uh, we're very grateful for our relationship with Hard Rock. We just fin finished Biloxi, we just put a new guitar up in Tulsa, we just finished Sacramento. We love Hard Rock. And we haven't done all their work, we've done a lot of their work. For some reason, at the end of that lease, they just did not care about that guitar. It was very strange to us. And so at the end of the lease, we're like, well, you know, the lease is over, you know. And they're like, yeah, we're done. <laughs> we said, well, the museum kind of wants it. And they're like, no, we're done. And we said, you know, for about $30,000, we can, you know, break this up in pieces and take care of it and set it aside and, and get this ready for renovation. They said, no, 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 no. We have, we have a destruction company that can come in for a 9000 and torch and go, and we're done. And so it became a really, really, really weird conversation. And it, it was almost like, you know, we're kind of done transactionally, we're done with this. And so good riddance, basically. You know, we'll honor the nine, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna sponsor you for the, for the 30. And that's where the Neon Museum came in because their crowdfunding efforts, and I don't know who in the room was in the middle of that, because it was a very expensive uh, repair or renovation. And it, it caught, the renovation was nearly as much. as around 300000 to renovate the guitar to put it back in, 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 its, in its place. And I got a very strange call from Hard Rock about <laughs> six months after. And I, I don't remember the man's name, but he's like, hi, what's up? Well, it's the same question, what's up with this guitar? And I, and I gave him the story. And he said, okay. He says, first he said, can I buy it? Can I buy it back from you? And I'm like, uh... Well, it's been in the news six times. It's crowdfunded. It's the Neon Museum. You know, no, I can't. You know, can't, uh, no. Sorry, I know it's got your name on it, but it's kind of gone down the river, so to speak. It's kind of done. He's like, okay, well, that's great. So there it sits. You know, in terms of branding and in terms of recognition, we, we couldn't be more proud of the guitar, and we couldn't be more grateful because we couldn't have done that, all that without the Neon Museum and the crowdfunding. And then to be able to still have a great relationship with Hard Rock, doing everything else we do for them. There's some beautiful guitars <laughs> around the world. Uh, yeah, and so that's, that's our side of the story. We're grateful for that guitar. Jeff, where do you envision signage in Las Vegas going, and do you think it will still continue to incorporate Neon? Okay, a Neon is... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we get this question. We get a quest, this question a lot, you know. And a lot of us in this room are neon enthusiasts, and we just don't ever want to see it to go away. Well, there's, there's some. Uh, I don't know if you want bad news or good news first. So let me start with the bad news. <laughs> LEDs are remarkably efficient and extremely safe, and very flexible and dynamic. So you can't get around the physics of LEDs. They're just phenomenal. And the arch going into Las Vegas, all those, the programmability of that is just you can't. You just can't get around it. Um, neon is very dangerous. It runs high voltage, it's 3,000 volts, 4,000, 9,000, sometimes 12, 15,000 volts of electricity, and, and 15,000 volts can be very, it'll burn, it'll arc and burn. So we have to be very careful how we manage it. And so that, the danger element, it makes LED compelling. And, so that's the bad news. The good news for neon enthusiasts in the room, unless you're all LED enthusiasts, maybe we have a show of hands. <laughs> is that there is so much neon in Vegas. It's in, and you can't see it all, it's in letters, it's in cabinet elements, it's in cove lighting, it's everywhere, and all of it needs to be maintained. And so yes, we used to have roughly 30 neon, full-time neon people that were bending and, and pumping and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we're down to a handful, five or six, so, uh, but they're working full-time, keeping, keeping track of and uh, taking care of our neon and we keep the patterns. So, you know, one of the neat pictures you have in there is a picture of, you know, the boxes we have in our neon room, which are just, it's really a fun, uh, really fun place. So, 
I, I, I probably prefer to end on the idea of think about the welcome to Las Vegas sign. Okay? There's neon on that sign, right? Is that neon going anywhere? No, it's not. And same for the hard rock guitar. That neon will never go away, and we will never stop fixing it. So for those of you that are worried that you're going to never see neon again, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. So before we open it up, before we open it up to public questions, I just want to thank you all again for being here. And the exhibit is directly across the street in the building right over here. And everybody take a look at it. It goes from the Boulder Club. The first sign is one of the first ones that we really pay tribute to. And we actually, as Jeff mentioned, the final panels were from a tour that we took when we were researching the exhibit. Yesco was gracious enough to give us a tour of the facility so you can actually get like an insider look of what the facility looks like, see their neon wall. You can see a couple of the glass blowers or the neon tubing like blowing glass. So it's really exciting because it covers really that full history of Yesco. And we, all three of us will be over there. If you have any questions or you want to know any more information, as you can tell, we really don't like to talk, but we will if you do have questions. And again, we'd like to give Bobby, Ann, and the Nevada Humanities a big thank you for hosting. And with that, before we invite everybody to actually tour the exhibit, who has questions? Yes, sir. I'm wondering, uh, is Yesco a union shop? That's a great question. So if you heard, he's asking if, if Yesco is a union shop. The union is represented in our factories based on where we are. And so we're in all the 10 western states, and we have two facilities that are union. We have a union in the Las Vegas shop and in Salt Lake. And so there are times when we get involved in union contracts outside of Nevada, and it's common for us to send our crews to those. We're working on one right now in, in Southern California. We send our crews down to do that, do that work. So short answer, yes, but not all of our facilities are union shops. Thanks for the question. Next, any other questions? Yes. What is the oldest sign in the Yesco Boneyard? I think that's a good question, probably for the. Do you mean the Neon Museum's Boneyard or Yesco's Boneyard? Well, our Boneyard is at the museum. Well, is there anything left over there? We get we turn most of it over. We've got a, a few signs here and there, but. So Emily, what is the oldest sign in the Neon Museum Boneyard? It is the Green Shack sign. It says cocktail, steak, and chicken. It stayed to the mid to late 1930s. We have uh, a bank sign uh, in our Salt Lake backyards. We have a, little, a few signs there for First Security Bank, which went up in the late 20s. We have a gas lamp cabinet without the faces. We have no idea what the sign was. And then we have other, a couple of other vintage signs in Salt Lake, not, not very big quantity, just a couple that look like they came from the late 20s, early 30s, which uh, are, you know, they're in bad shape. But So yeah, we have a stick of glass in our Salt Lake Neon shop from that's dated 1936. Mm -hmm. And mind you, there's no filament. So as long as the gas is there and the electrodes don't burn out, that gas will just burn. It's not going anywhere. It's one of the noble gases. It's just amazing. And that tube still burns today. So there's, there's, we don't have it lit, we have it set aside. So there's no reason why neon functionally can't just light up forever. It's amazing. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about your um, work with the special collections? Can you tell us about your work with UNLV Special Collections and Archives? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, this, the, the funny story is my dad met a historian and historian and he said, what do you do? I'm a historian. I don't know, some business meeting or something. He says, oh, we got a bunch of pictures. It's pretty, pretty neat. So let me come over. He's like, where are your pictures? He says, they're over there in those cardboard boxes. <laughs> and he's like, what? You know, his head about exploded. You know, he just like, you don't keep pictures and things like that in the office in cardboard boxes <laughs> with temperature and humidity and everything else, UV and everything else. So under his tutelage, uh, we hired, my father hired him. And he very carefully went through and, and uh, scanned everything in the, in the day. This would have been in preparation for our 75th. So this is quite a few years ago. And uh, once we got them together, he says, these need to be in the, in the care of, of someone that knows what they're doing and has the facility to take care of them. And so gratefully, our historian's name is D. Halverson. 
we have D to thank for telling us that we need to get our pictures to the university where they can be taken care of. And so uh, they've been very generous with us in working with us. And there's, you know, it was so long ago, a lot of us don't, haven't, you know, we should spend more time, right, Kelly, uh, looking through what's, what's there. There's some great treasures there. Yeah. Yes, UNLV Special Collections and Archives is open to the public. But yes, thank you for preserving your collection for future generations. I think everybody in the room greatly appreciates that. Well, my father, he took a lot of pictures. I mean, you say, say Hasselblad. My brother and I remember my dad, he had a Hasselblad around his neck most everywhere he went. And so, you know, gratefully he was, he was shooting, not as many as you have, <laughs> but uh, he took a lot of pictures. Do we have any other questions? Yes. What are some current projects YESCO is working on in Las Vegas? Yeah, so um, we sign non-disclosures on a lot of what we do. That's going to temper what I, you know, what I can share. Um, the current, we, we have a screen. If you think of Palms for a minute, you think of Harmon, on Harmon, that corner, those are two very, very large signs. They aren't as big as the Fremont Street Experience because that's still size-wise in 1995 was the biggest, largest display we had ever done. Our system was up for 10 years, 95 to, you know, for 10 years after that. Um, if you take palms and multiply by 28 times, that's our one on deck. The only thing is I can't tell you where it's going to be. But when it's done, <laughs> when it's finished, it's going to be really big and really fun. <laughs> And really awesome. So we're, we're getting, um, in fact, we have a big sale that's being posted today. We're also under non-disclosure on a very prominent corner. And it's a renovation. We're using existing footings. But we're doing a whole new, dazzling new display in the place of one that's existed for a very long time. And when you find out about that one, you're going to be very excited about that one, too. Because it's surrounded by a lot of other wonderful signs on, in, you know, main area. So, yep. Fun stuff. Yes, a very, very good answer. You've left us all well, quite intrigued. Well, we, we can talk about Allegiant. We did 4,000 signs in Allegiant. That was just a blast. You know, we didn't do the scoring inside, but the rooftop, the letters on the outside, the light bands, every directional, there's thousands. I, I, the first time I went and I just stopped and I just counted and I counted 40 <laughs> signs that I could see in just one spot. And so we're very, you know, as a community, we are very, very happy to have that facility. To be involved as a signed contractor was, a, was a, just a wonderful thing for us because that building's going to endure for decades upon decades upon decades. Yeah. And there are also photographs from our tour where you can see inside the ESCO facility the Allegiant Sign Stadium. You can see the photographs of the signage there as well as when you guys were restoring Vegas Vicky. So in the more modern panels, you will see both of those. Question in the back? Can you talk to us about the Circa signs? Yeah. How many of you have been to Circa? Most of you. Okay. Well, uh, the, the reason that corner is important is because that's where the Overland Hotel was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the first neon sign anywhere was there. And then you come forward to Vegas Vicky. I'll just tell you a quick funny story. So um, you know, when, they, when they opened that hotel, the press conference was, I mean, of all the places, they, if you've been seeing Stadium Swim how, in this, this sports book, it's amazing, right? And of all places for Derek Stevens to stand when he kicked his hotel off was he was standing in front of Vegas Vicky. And we took immense care and time to understand what she would have looked like when she was built by AdArt, another company, not by us. And we really went long to, to make sure that she represented what she should have represented. You know, she's too big to get in the door. So we pulled her, we pulled her down, we renovated her, we boxed her up and we put her inside the hotel and they basically built the hotel around her. Okay. And, uh, and then it was a coworker of mine who said this. I said, well, how much does she weigh? And he said, we promised Vegas Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rick Tulane. I can't take credit for that. I, I saw that on TV, and I thought, that's funny. That's really, really funny. But anyway, once the hotel was done, we lifted her and put her up on place. So uh, the press conference was at, Erica was there. The press conference was at 1 o'clock. And I got there at 4.30 in the morning for morning shots, and the leg wasn't kicking. 
I'm like, oh, okay, we have the cruise there, so we're good. So 4 o'clock to 5, leg's not kicking, 5, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., well, you know where this story's going. Well, the leg's not kicking, and I start, I start hearing from facilities, then I start hearing from middle management, then I start hearing from upper management, and then I know I'm one step away from you-know-who. So um, <laughs> I screenshotted my phone when it started kicking, when they fixed it, 1259. <laughs> one o'clock press conference. So, you know, those types of things, I want to make sure that everything's working before. It was working fine the, the day before we had a, an, an issue with it. But so the, Derek's final line in his welcome to Circa was, and the leg is kicking again. <laughs> so, you know, when we're partners with these hotels, you know, to make these signs come together, it, it isn't always painless, and it can often be a, a white knuckle but uh, that sign is absolutely beautiful, and, and what a, an amazing historic place for all those, not only Vegas Vicky, but all the other signs. Those, uh, the ones on the corner that are script and curved, the structure behind those, those signs are just as pretty from the guts out than they are from the outside. And to be able to be programmable, LED, for the entire building and all the letters to be programmable together is a whole new level for, for them and for, for us. So technologically speaking, that hotel is something else, and it's a beautiful swimming pool. Wow. Nice pool. It's a beautiful resort, beautiful place. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Are you related to Brigham Young? Are you related to Brigham Young? Interesting question. So, yeah, so Brigham Young led the pioneers to Utah, 1848, and um, he came, his family was in the southern part of the UK, generations before and we were in northern England in, in Sunderland in fact two generations before my grandfather were actually Scottish and so um, we don't have any direct immediate tie we get that a lot because there's a lot of there's a lot of youngs in Utah we're the other youngs <laughs> we're the sign youngs and so we're, we're we're proud to be youngs and we're grateful our family is here you know it was a big move for my great-grandfather to just pick up everything and go um, they didn't have much and so for them to make it and you know create an enterprise it really is you know for us to be able to work in a, in a great organization and provide for our employees and our customers is just a testament to the American dream you know really so no direct relationship we, we admire Brigham he he, he uh, was a remarkable pioneer um, back back in the day so we could go on a little bit longer about Brigham Young but I think I'll stop there we can talk in the other room if we need to any other questions okay I Yes. What is the most controversial sign that Yesco has ever created? Good question. So um, let me answer it this way. We, um, we have a billboard business, and controversy, controversy usually happens in our billboard business. And what happens is people, they want to put up something shocking. And so um, we're kind of on the other end saying, well, you know, we really are not in a position to take 500 phone calls. <laughs> you know, when someone wants to place an ad on our, on our sign, and, you know, we have to be kind of careful about what the community is reading. You know, you have this balance. The, the challenge for us is you have this balance between free speech and a provider, you know, a private or enterprise. And so, you know, we've, we've set a few boundaries. We don't, we don't feel like that our platform is set up to bash anybody. We commonly have people wanting to, to, to get ads to say, you know, I, I hate this congressman or I hate this or I hate that. We've kind of taken, we, we'd much rather do the other side of, of, of communication of, of good messages rather than negative messages because that tends to backfire for us. So, um, yeah, the billboard and the digital billboard realize those, those graphics and image go up really easy. And so we're, a lot of people are pressing to get their message up on those boards and sometimes those are controversial a little bit. Does that, does that kind of help? Yeah. Excellent. Again, we would like to thank Yesco. You guys have made such a iconic statement to the Las Vegas skyline. And Emily and the others from the Neon Museum, there's quite a lot of people from the Neon Museum here today. Thank you for all the work that you do in the preservation of the signs and the neon history and all the great work and preservation that you do. And again, thank you, Bobby Ann and the Nevada Humanities.